All right, I'm in the mood to have a little bit of fun, so I'm going to read this article from Psychology Today. The Mind of a Conspiracy Theorist, Why Are So Many People Drawn to Conspiracies in Times of Crisis? Now, you guys are in luck because I just so happen to be an actual conspiracy theorist. So let's see how close to my mind this author got with her insights here. By now, scientists have roundly debunked the theory that the coronavirus was created in a lab. Well, from the start here, this is news to me. I was unaware that this had been so thoroughly debunked <laughs> already. Good to know. But we see the standard tactic being used where all we have to do is refer to scientists or experts in a sentence and it is immediately viewed as credible we, we don't need to question who these scientists were who these experts were we just say hey scientists and experts have roundly debunked the theory that the coronavirus was created in a lab don't need to worry about that anymore okay <laughs> moving on to the next sentence but that hasn't stopped nearly 30 percent of americans from believing it According to a recent Pew survey, and many of these believers have made the leap from that premise to the theory that a powerful villain unleashed the virus to control the population. Billionaire philanthropists George Soros and Bill Gates are on the short list, although conspiracy theorists aren't ruling out the Clintons. You can sense the disdain coming through the words here. It has an energy of disdain that is just in a total mocking tone about what is being reported, scoffing at the very notion that there is corruption at the highest levels of both government and private corporations. But you also see how the controlled conspiracy platforms on YouTube and other places play their role in all this, right? Because this is what they promote. George Sor Soros and Bill Gates are the pre-approved frontmen who they are allowed to expose and talk about, right? But it never goes anywhere further than that. So they are hiding the larger apparatus. That's their job is to be on TV in the case of Bill Gates or to be the financial paper trail in the case of George Soros. And then it just stops there, and the media can then come in and say, oh, look, they always say it's Soros or Gates, all these crazy people on the Internet, and there's no proof that they're actually doing any of this. You see, these people are nuts. And the Clintons are thrown in for a good measure because this is characterized as a left-right issue. Of course, all of these names are quote-unquote left because that's how they've structured the narrative. They want it to be this divided thing where if you're a conspiracy theorist, you're on the right, and if you're not, you're on the left. When the Black Lives Matter movement gained momentum in the midst of the pandemic, another wave of believers embraced conspiracy theories linking the two phenomena including the rumor that Soros had instigated the protests as the next step in his path to world domination. And it's so funny, a sentence like this is put in here without any further elaboration, meaning there is well-documented evidence of George Soros and the Open Society being involved in all kinds of uprisings in places other than America. There are paper trails that prove this, that he paid certain actors to go into these places and agitate, disrupt. It's the same tactic that the CIA has been using in South America, Central America, the Caribbean for decades. It's just Soros is doing it in Europe. But 
at the same time, they can openly say, well, look, there's no evidence that Soros is actually funding Antifa, but that's irrelevant to the larger point here. The larger point is they actually do these kinds of things, so it is perfectly reasonable to suggest that they are doing it with Antifa as well. And that's a politically correct way of me saying, yes, obviously these people are paid. <laughs> they, they are paid to go in and organize these quote-unquote protests that the media then coincidentally promotes. And someone like this says, oh, the movement gained momentum. Well, how did it gain momentum? Because the media was promoting it over and over and over again, like it was an actual thing. Because in spite of the scoffing that's going on in this sentence here, yes, they actually are working together to create these things. <laughs> Both COVID-19 and systemic racism pose real life or death dangers. So why are so many people becoming preoccupied instead with threats that have no grounding in reality? Again, this is a blanket statement here presupposing that none of these claims have any basis in reality when that's obviously not true. It's partly because of the magnitude of the real threats, psychologists say. Oh, the psychologists are going to speak now, and these are the experts. Studies show that conspiracy theories tend to snowball during times of crisis, when fear is rampant and clear explanations are in short supply. They appeal in part because they offer a straightforward narrative and someone to blame. This is the tried and true excuse that they use over and over again, which is, oh, yes, we're all just uh, fearing this uncertain world, this chaotic world that makes no sense. After all, we're just smart monkeys that managed to create this random civilization at some point, and it's so complex and chaotic that bad things just happen, and there's no real explanation for it, so why are you trying to find one? And if you're trying to find one, Clearly, you're just doing that out of fear because you want someone to blame for whatever's happening to you. They use this excuse over and over again. But researchers are starting to pay more attention to these theories and the motives and mechanisms that drive them as it becomes clear that they aren't a harmless method for coping with the unknown. They can have truly damaging consequences in the real world. At the core of every conspiracy theory is the idea that a powerful person or group of people is secretly hatching a dastardly scheme. <laughs> Almost anything that makes headlines can spawn these theories, especially when there's room for confusion about what really happened. In June, when a 75-year-old man was hospitalized after police pushed him to the ground during a Black Lives Matter protest, some claimed he was in fact a paid crisis actor or an Antifa provocateur a theory that gained traction when the president posted about it on Twitter. Right, here's the agenda once again, the president's role in all of this, President Trump that is. Around the same time, an apparent increase in fireworks displays in New York and other cities sparked similarly baseless rumors that the police were setting them off in an attempt to wage psychological warfare on prote protesters. I don't know about the fireworks, but there was definitely someone setting out piles of bricks all over the place with no <laughs> explanation given for who was putting them there. So I don't think it's a stretch to consider the possibility that someone was setting off these fireworks every night to drive people crazy and just amp up the energy of agitation that they wanted going on during this time. I mean, everybody was already stuck in their house at home going a little stir crazy and then now they got to listen to these fireworks going off all the time, just driving them even madder than they already were. The coronavirus pandemic is a particularly fertile breeding ground for such thinking, says Roland Imhoff, a social psychologist at Germany's Johann Gutenberg University. It's terrifying, not well understood, and happening on a massive scale. And in the face of pandemic-level panic... Again, no one panicking other than the media. If the media was not panicking, no one would care because when you go outside, as someone left a comment to me along these lines just recently, when you go outside and you're not watching TV or looking at your computer, the pandemic disappears. You wouldn't know anything was going on unless 
you turn those devices on and actually look for it. Well, I suppose you would know at this point because everybody's wearing masks, but other than that, you would have no idea if you had been in the woods for the past 10 years and you just came out right now, you'd be like, why is everybody wearing a mask? What is going on? Because there are no other overt signs of any sort of illness taking place. It's completely absent. To say that the whole world has come to a halt because a teeny-weeny virus jumped from a bat to another animal and then to a guy in a Chinese market seems too insignificant an explanation, Imhoff says. But a conspiracy theory that has thousands of people in cahoots, that seems more proportional. This, of course, is a very disingenuous statement. I mean, maybe this guy doesn't know how it works, but no, it's compartmentalized. There don't need to be a thousand people involved. There would only be a very small number of people that would actually know what's going on. And in the case of a virus, all you have to do is release it. I mean, it takes maybe, what, five people to get a virus released like this and have it eventually do its thing like all other coronaviruses do and spread? You wouldn't need hardly anybody involved. And then, of course, your media conglomerate is involved, and then they start pushing the pandemic narrative. But all of those news anchors are CIA assets, <laughs> so they're involved from the beginning anyway. Or insert your three-letter acronym agency here, right? It doesn't really matter which one it is. They're all working together in some way, shape, or form. Again, that's compartmentalized too, right? Because if you talk to the FBI and the CIA, they would say, oh, well, we're at odds a lot of the time. No, that's just you field agent types. <laughs> you don't understand what's going on. I mean, that's just the nature of bureaucracy, right? You get tied up in the red tape of everything when you try to work together or interact or everybody's searching for jurisdiction so they get to be in the limelight. The whole thing is all very convoluted. But that's not what I'm talking about here. Past health crises from the AIDS epidemic to the Zika outbreak gave rise to theories eerily similar to those circulating today about coronavirus. At times like these, conspiracy theories are more appealing than the truth because they offer the possibility of control, Imhoff says. We can thwart an evil plan, at least hypothetically, but we can't thwart the unseen forces of nature. Again, they are constantly referring to this idea that it is somehow this naturally nebulous, chaotic force that is behind world events. None of this is planned. There are no orchestrated events. No, this is all random. And so conspiracy theories are just a way to try to make sense of this randomness. It makes people feel better. And I'm sitting here thinking, what a disingenuous thing to say, because I would actually feel better if something like 9-11 was actually done by 19 Muslims who hijacked planes and flew them into a building. That would make me feel better than the actual reality of the situation where, oh no, this thing was planned for decades in some sort of massive ceremonial magic ritual. <laughs> that, I would feel better if it was the actual story that the media promotes, you see. <laughs> uh, so this whole thing that they have going on here with this uh, randomness excuse is total bunk. Conspiracy theories make a very tempting promise. Just stop the villain and you get your life back. That's what we all want. He says, it's a charming narrative that's very easy to buy into. Just stop Bill Gates from polluting the airways with 5G. You see, I went over this in my very first video on COVID-19. This is why every event has the pre-scripted conspiracy theories woven into it. And then the agents promote those because later, in hindsight, they write sentences like this. The material writes itself, and this has a debunking effect, where, oh my gosh, look at what these people are trying to say. This is outrageous. Clearly, there's nothing more to this. That's what they bank on. Just stop Bill Gates from polluting the airways with 5G, and we can go out again, and our kids can go back to school. <laughs> It's no surprise that so many people are currently enthralled to this narrative, but studies show that some people are especially prone to those beliefs. 
even without the motivating uncertainty of a global health crisis. Researchers, again, who are these researchers, have found that this conspiracy mentality correlates with particular personality traits, including low levels of trust and an increased need for closure, along with feelings of powerlessness, low self-esteem, paranoid thinking, and a need to feel unique. Oh, yes. That's why I'm a conspiracy theorist. It's because I just want to be unique and I have terminally low self-esteem and I feel powerless and I'm paranoid. <laughs> I mean, get out of here with this garbage, man. I mean, there's no other way to describe what I just read. Uh, the only thing that was true here is low levels of trust, but it's only a half truth in the sense that I was a fully trusting person for the majority of my life until I was exposed to the system in ways that made me start to question this. Then I start doing a little research and figure out, oh, nothing that I thought was true is actually true. Uh, and it has nothing to do with any of this. In many ways, learning about this stuff makes you feel anything but powerless. You actually start to take control of your life. It gives you more self-esteem getting into this stuff. You become less paranoid when you actually tap into intuition that is a gift from creation. Unbelievable. It's a worldview that believes nothing happens without a reason and that there are sinister forces at work behind the curtain. And, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Imhoff says, it's a fairly stable worldview, so it doesn't really matter what happens. That will be their interpretation. Now, okay, I will at least concede ground here to that statement. There is some credibility to what he just said there. There's some legitimacy there. You can get locked into that idea and apply it to everything that you see and everything that's reported, and then you can mischaracterize or misjudge a situation based on that general worldview that you're adhering to, right? That general idea that, well, nothing is happening here by accident. This is all scripted, right? I kind of went over that in a prior recording. Still, roughly half of the U.S. population believes in at least one political or medical conspiracy theory, so it's hard to define these beliefs as abnormal, says UCLA psychiatrist Joseph Pierre, you know, and they, he phrased this in a way that was sort of like, well, we would like to characterize this as abnormal, but we can't because too many people believe in one. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. One thing to emphasize is that we all have needs for closure, uniqueness, and the like. It's more a matter of some of these needs or biases being stronger among those who believe in conspiracy theories, he says. Again, this is a completely baseless correlation that is being made here. Totally fabricated. Conspiracy thinking can also be attributed to external forces, including racial and social inequity, that erode our trust in authority figures, Pierre argues. Now, that's interesting, too, because they're having all sorts of problems with the black community who figured out all of this stuff a long time ago based on what they had to go through as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, they're just openly stating now, hey, we're not going to take this vaccine. So that is true that when you are exposed to social inequity and other systemic oppression, yeah, you start to figure out that the government is full of it, <laughs> you know? And then that's passed on generation to generation, that general worldview. And it's so funny because the white boomers are just now figuring that out, right? They're just now figuring out, oh, I see what's going on here. This isn't what I thought it was. When people lose their faith in official accounts, their search for answers often takes them down the rabbit hole, he says. Most conspiracy theorists aren't theorizing so much as they're looking for answers and finding ones that resonate 
with the mistrust that got them searching in the first place. Real dangers. On its own, belief in conspiracies isn't inherently dangerous. Or wrong psychologists say, oh, well, that's a relief. The psychologist told me it's not inherently wrong. Now, that's how very magnanimous of them. <laughs> After all, sometimes powerful people really are hatching secret schemes. If Edward Snowden hadn't suspected that top U.S. intelligence officials were engaged in a massive wiretapping conspiracy, for example, he couldn't have exposed the NSA's very real covert surveillance program. And, wow, this is a layered thing right here, too, because... First of all, we don't even know that Edward Snowden is a real human being. That's the first thing. Second, his disclosure of the covert surveillance program was a part of the agenda. It was a part of the agenda that we're now seeing the next step of, which is getting people to lose faith in their government and their country in America. And that's what the voter fraud narrative is the next stage and that's what that's all about as i went into in that video i mean it really worked too after i made that video i was talking to my dad at thanksgiving and he told me based on what he observed based on his worldview and how he perceives all of this that he will no longer fly an american flag because they stole the election from donald trump he said i'm never flying my flag again <laughs> and i'm sitting there thinking in my head like oh my gosh yes this is what i was talking about they they made the election fraud so obvious so the boomer generation would lose faith in the country and it would feed into that whole domestic terrorist angle that i was going into as well Obviously not on the level that my dad's at, but it'll be the other layers to it that will be involved in the domestic terrorism aspect of it. And that'll be how they further the agenda in other ways going forward. But what Edward Snowden disclosed was a part of that, you know, the official acknowledgement that, yes, we spy on you, even though we all already knew that for years this was the official acknowledgement of it to the point where no one could argue with it anymore. Okay, it's been officially admitted. And that's kind of what's going on with Pizzagate as well. It was a way to officially acknowledge that pedophilia, human trafficking is going on. It's like Epstein was the next layer to that as well. And it's still kind of ongoing through Ghislaine Maxwell. Not only do you have all of this other stuff going on in the country, but now you're finding out, oh my goodness, the politicians are pedophiles too. <laughs> you know, it's just this one thing after another that is building into this crescendo of America losing faith in itself. Because America is the only thing that stands in the way of this agenda meaning the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. That's the only thing that stands in the way of this agenda. And so it is attacked on a daily basis and has been for the past 50 years. I mean, longer than that, of course, but it really went into overdrive in the last 50 years after World War II. Skepticism toward people in power is part of a healthy democracy, Imhoff argues, it enables the checks and balances that prevent abuses and ultimately protect the public. But people with a conspiracy mindset distrust nearly everyone, especially experts. Oh, no, he called me out. <laughs> no, it's not that I distrust experts. It's that that term is used, as I was saying, without any sort of elaboration to justify whatever you want to justify. You have to actually list who the experts are so we can research those experts and their credentials to make sure that they're not being funded by the very people that are behind all of these agendas. That's what it means to distrust experts, generally. It's just a process of verifying their credentials. But these articles like this just bypass that whole process and just say, experts say, blah, blah, blah. 
And that becomes problematic when it leads to an erosion of credibility that puts scientists on the same level as someone who just posted a video on YouTube. If I trust the scientists and you trust the guy on YouTube, there's no common ground between us. And having a shared understanding of reality is essential to society. Without it, there is no truth anymore. That's a huge danger. We'll read between the lines there about what he's saying. He, he's saying that there's a part of reality that is detaching itself from consensus. And that's you and I. Whoever's listening to this, we're detaching ourselves from the consensus reality. And what he means is there's no objective truth anymore that is being given to people. So that's a huge danger for them, you see. But at the same time, there is a valid point in there, like, yeah, the guy on YouTube, like me, doesn't have a PhD in astrophysics, so the person with the PhD in astrophysics is going to have a more valid explanation for a subject that relates to that than I will, but that doesn't mean that that person understands the truth better than I do. Because the truth is a function of intuition, and that's something that's given to you by creation, not books. Even more troubling, conspiracy thinking is correlated with a tendency toward violent thoughts and fantasies, and to some degree with real violence. And this is where their controlled opposition, scripted, staged events come into play here, right? Because... I can safely say that nothing that I've read on here has ever given me a thought to be violent. <laughs> on here, I mean the internet. Nothing I've ever consumed or assimilated into my being has ever given me the idea, hmm, I'm going to go be violent now. No, if anything, it makes me want to detach even more. Just don't even come around me. Leave me alone, <laughs> you know? Uh, but then they have things like the Comet Pizza shooting where, oh, this was because somebody was radicalized online. That's a big one. That's a big uh, buzzword. He was radicalized online by the conspiracy theorists, those alt-right, anti-Semitic racists that are everywhere. I mean, you've seen BitChute. Look at what they say. <laughs> University of Miami political scientist Joseph Ucinski found that people who were generally inclined to believe in conspiracy theories were twice as likely as non-believers to agree that violence was an acceptable form of political protest. I mean, get out of here. This just sounds like a contrived study. What were the criteria for it? What was the control group? On and on. We don't have any of this information. This is just somebody saying, oh, yes, conspiracy theorists were twice as likely to be violent. Get out of here. Some, such as Timothy McVeigh, again, how is Timothy McVeigh a representative of what a regular person watching YouTube videos is? <laughs> it's not. That's the answer whose suspicions of the federal government led to the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, have even committed atrocities on the basis of conspiracy beliefs. Conspiracy-motivated terrorists, wow, what a statement there. Like McVeigh are rare, Yusinski says, but less egregious examples abound, especially among the new wave of coronavirus-related conspiracy believers. There are the dozens of 5G cell towers that have been vandalized in the UK, because of the theory that 5G tech is being used to spread the virus and the rising number of hate crimes against Asian Americans. I've never even heard that this was happening. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not, but I didn't hear anything about this. Uh, but anyway, I went into this again in the first video on COVID-19. Um, they're setting fires to the towers themselves so they can point at it as something that we're doing, the conspiracy theorists. No. Nobody thought of that when they heard that theory. And if any regular person has since done something like that, it's only because the government or these agencies did it first and showed them, hey, this is what you should do. And is that not how these protests work? The provocateurs come out and start vandalizing stuff and making it okay for other people to get involved. And then that's how the riot starts.
I mean, the overwhelming majority of these people who are arrested for plots against uh, officials, like the one in Michigan with Governor Whitmer, I think that's her name, uh, the FBI recruited and got them to go through with it. It's like these things wouldn't take place if the agencies didn't coerce them to happen. <laughs> As the connections between conspiracy theories and the real-world harm become evident, researchers are focusing more on beliefs they might have once shrugged off as a bit of innocuous eccentricity on these social fringes. We can't assume anymore that they're trivial, harmless little things, says social psychologist Karen Douglas of the University of Kent. Some of them are reasonably popular. The belief that climate change is a hoax. I mean, that's not a belief. That's a, a fact. <laughs> but they don't go into the full definition here, which is the belief that human-caused climate change is a hoax. We're not denying climate change in general. That would be absurd. The climate changes all the time. Or that vaccines are dangerous, for example. These beliefs have real consequences. You can't just dismiss them. Increased belief in vaccine-related conspiracy theories, including that the vaccines cause autism or are being used to implant microchips, has already led to a resurgence of measles and other preventable illnesses in some areas. And coronavirus-related theories could have even more devastating public health effects. Assuming that a successful coronavirus vaccine becomes available, an Associated Press poll found that 20% of Americans said they would refuse the vaccine and 31% weren't sure if they would get it which could keep the U.S. from achieving herd immunity and put vulnerable people at risk. Oh, boy. Believers of the many competing theories about the coronavirus have one thing in common, an unwillingness to follow the guidance of public health officials. According to research by New York University's Annie Sternisco and colleagues, Sternisco found that people who bought into these theories were less likely to engage in social distancing <laughs> or to support public health policies aimed at limiting contagion, regardless of whether they believe the virus was a hoax or a lab-grown bioweapon. And hey, if we're going to assign blame here, this is the media's fault. This is the boy who cried wolf. Lie to us over and over again, and we're going to think you're lying during a pandemic, even if it's actually taking place. <laughs> so whose fault is it? And there's a good chance that some people who believe the virus is a hoax also believe it's a bioweapon, Douglas says. One of the quirks of conspiracy belief is that people are able to embrace multiple theories simultaneously, even when those theories contradict each other. Oh, I went over this in another video. No, this is very disingenuous, what's being said here. I'll read this first and then get into it. In a study published in 2012, Douglas found that people who believed one conspiracy theory were more likely to believe another, even if it was logically impossible for both to be true. For example, the more someone believed the theory that Princess Diana faked her own death, the more they believed she'd been murdered by British secret agents. Uh, no, what we're saying is that the official narrative is most likely not true. Therefore, there must be an alternative explanation, and so we are more likely to believe A, that it was Princess Diana faking her own death, or B, that she was murdered by British secret agents. A or B can't both happen at the same time. They both aren't true simultaneously. However, we're just open to the idea that either one of them is true. But if you did a poll in some contrived study, it would come out with the disingenuous result that they were going for here, which is, oh, well, look, these conspiracy theorists are so stupid, they believe in two things at the same time that can't both be true. No, that's not what it is. Nice try, though. The problem for believers is that embracing these theories is an ineffective way to deal with our anxieties, Douglas says. They offer a sense of certainty, but they also make us believe that malevolent forces are out to get us, which in most cases is scarier than the truth. They can make you feel even worse, more out of control, more uncertain, she says. It becomes a bit of a cycle. How can we stop conspiracy theories from spreading? It's a critical question, especially now, researchers say, and there's no easy answer. 
After all, conspiracy theories have always existed and no amount of counter evidence has been able to change the minds of people who still think the moon landing was fake or that JFK's assassination was the work of a deep state conspiracy. The difference is that the stakes have never been higher when it comes to believing misinformation. The consequence of believing the Earth is flat or the moon landing was staged is basically nothing. No one's harmed by that. But in a pandemic, you could potentially have deaths on a massive scale if people believe the pandemic was a hoax, says NYU social psychologist Jay Van Bavel. And again, it's not that the virus is a hoax. It's that you lied about the death rate of this virus to the point where in function, yes, it's a hoax pandemic because all of the things that we are engaged with and doing isn't necessary because no one's dying from it in actuality or very few people are dying from it. And conspiracy theories seem to be spreading faster than ever, partly because of the way they are magnified by social media. And again, here we have the reasoning for why social media needs to be censored. Van Bavel says his research examines why false information on social media travels faster and reaches larger audiences than accurate information. The pandemic video was viewed by millions of people within days. <laughs> There's no editorial oversight, so it moves much faster. Well, again, I went over the whole pandemic thing and how that was actually fake conspiracy information put out by them. So you see the convoluted layers at work here. Recent efforts by Twitter and Facebook to crack down on misinformation, including the QAnon conspiracy theories. Again, here's another conspiracy theory promoted by the establishment itself, QAnon, completely bunk, which center on the belief that a powerful cabal of pedophiles and Satanists is working to undermine the president are a step in the right direction, Van Bavel believes. But social media isn't solely responsible for the spread of these theories, Yusinski says. We can't even say for certain whether conspiracy theories are any more prevalent or influ influential now than in the past. Just look at the witch trials of the 17th century and the Illuminati panics of the early 19th century. The fact that social media can carry theories like these farther, wider, and faster doesn't mean that a greater proportion of people will ultimately believe them. When we poll about the moon landing conspiracy, we find only about 5% of people buy into it. Given how many people have heard of it, which is almost 100%, you'd think that number would be higher, he says. But why isn't it? Because people have filters, they don't believe everything they read. On the other hand, banning individuals who post these theories, as Facebook and Twitter did with conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, who claimed, among other things, that the Sandy Hook uh, shooting was staged, could give their claims more credence among those who are predisposed to believe conspiracy theories, Sternisco argues. People who are prone to believe conspiracy theories might take this as evidence that Jones is onto something and got censored because the government didn't want people to hear it, she says. Well, that's obviously true, and that's why so many of these channels are faking censorship, because it gives them perceived credibility. There is some data showing that these steps can backfire. Sternisco and other researchers say the most successful efforts to fight conspiracy theories give people the tools they need to question false claims for themselves. <laughs> we should make people more science literate and more media literate, and these things can be taught early on. Oh, here we go with the Orwellian nature of this. Let's just start correcting wrong think when children are in kindergarten, right? That'll solve the problem. There is some evidence that courses in critical thinking actually work in making people less susceptible. Right now, people are just trying to make sense of a frightening, confusing time. The more facts they're equipped with, the less powerless they'll feel, and the harder it will be for conspiracy theories to take hold, especially when it comes to the coronavirus, Sternisco says. The more we learn about this virus, the fewer gaps people will have to fill with conspiracy theories, she says. If there is so much information that contradicts their false notions, at some point people who aren't diehard conspiracy theorists will have to update their beliefs, they're not deluded. They just want to understand and have certainty. Uh, how interesting, right, this sentence here. It's actually like the reverse of this is happening. If there's so much information on social media that's contradicting the narrative of the mainstream media and the controlled alternative media, at some point... 
people who are not conspiracy theorists will have to update their beliefs and become conspiracy theorists because it will be undeniable. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? And they're not deluded. They just want to understand and have certainty about what's going on. So you see how they completely flip the narrative and try to use it for their benefit. What's actually going on here? And that's the end of the article. Later.